Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Warm welcome to our pe first People Hub, actually, of 2021. It's nice to see some familiar faces on the screen now. I wish I could see you face to face, but hopefully, hopefully this year I will. <laughs> Particularly, Julie, maybe at some, some glamorous event, you never know. <laughs> so uh, what we plan to do today is talk to you about absence. What we have found, and, and talking to the ops team, recently obviously with every lockdown comes challenges for us all personally professionally but we have found that there's been a real challenge we know our, within our own businesses our people uh, can be very challenged because with particularly when the schools are closed uh, we've got you know covid absences we've got people self-isolating and we've got general absence that is already normally happening, that is happening a lot around this time. So we just thought it'd be great. We'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, Dan, who I'm going to introduce, introduce you to shortly, will go through um, a fantastic presentation. We'll take some questions after that. So if you've got any questions, please use the chat during the session. Uh, we want to make this interactive. We want to help and advise as, as much as possible. Uh, but we thought it'd be great as well. It's a great opportunity to be able to sort of share best practices with one another. And we'll sort of end with Dan doing, uh, as, as he does, does best, just a sort of a legal cap, recap on, on what's sort of happening at the moment and what's, what's to come uh, in the employment law timetable. So if you don't know me, my name is Victoria. I'm the Managing Director of High Performance and 1HR. I'm joined with Dan, Dan Miner, who is our 1HR guru. So if you do have 1HR, you will have met Dan along the way. He's going to navigate us through our slides, ask us probably some difficult questions if he doesn't like us today. Uh, and, and he'll obviously just uh, pick any, any questions from you up in the chat. I'm going to hand over shortly to Dan Mayer Lopez. Dan is uh, one of our uh, experts within the ops team. He is our in-house employment lawyer. So there's not a lot that Dan doesn't know or hasn't heard of. So I'm sure if you've got any questions that you feel a bit random, they're probably not. So please feel free to pop them in the chat. If we can all just keep ourselves on mute while Dan is going through his presentation, that'd be fantastic. So over to you, Dan. Thanks, Vic. Okay, so um, just a bit of housekeeping here as well. I, I'm not trying to masquerade as Chris Whitty or anybody at Downing Street. So Dan has kindly agreed to go through the slides for me. So if I say next slide, it's not because I'm trying to masquerade as somebody far more important or far more knowledgeable. So uh, yeah, we are here at the People Hub. So the People Hub has been put together to bring like-minded people together, businesses, HR consultants, HR managers, office managers, to discuss the issues that businesses face every day. As Vic said, with every lockdown, there's new challenges, there's new issues, and with, like she says, with both personal and also on a professional basis. So the People Hub is here to support you, uh, which is why we've asked you to join. So feel free to let colleagues and um, other business owners know, because we do think this is a really useful forum for businesses to discuss the issues that they're facing, because it's, it's like that old thing that they say at school, no question's a silly question, because if you're thinking it, I'm sure there's other business owners across the Northwest and across the country that are going through the same things as we all are. So these questions that have come up have been from a number of different clients over the last few weeks, just in preparation for this. And like I say, if you're thinking it, there's going to be somebody else who's thinking it. So we're here to, to also promote our services as well, to say that we're here to support you. So if you or colleagues or the business owners think that you could benefit from high performance or one HR or both, then obviously we can certainly do that for you um, and we'd be happy to have a chat with you just to see if we can help you and how we can help you. So, um, so yeah, that's the introduction to the People Hub. Like Vic said, if you've got any questions along the way, feel free to pop them in the, the chat section and then we can address them at the end. Next slide, please, Dan. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> okay, so absence management. So as we've said, I know it, it, it's probably going to be said quite a lot during this, is there's a number of reasons why people might be absent during the lockdown period. So the reasons could be sickness, could be caring commitments, could be due to sickness related to COVID, or it could be long-term sickness, including mental health. So where do you start? The first start is look at the reason for it. So what is the, the reason? So there's four potentials. There could be a number of others that we could be here all day to discuss things like flexible working, 
parents who've got kids and those sorts of things. So where do you start? The first place to start is what's the issue? So is it sickness? Is it caring? Is it COVID related sickness? Is it long term sickness? So the first place to start, if you've, you've got one, is your company handbook or your policies and procedures, because that will tell you where you start. So if it's a sickness issue, then obviously you'd look at your sickness policy. If it's COVID, then I think everybody's already quite aware of what to do in COVID, when people need to self-isolate, the fact that there's SSP available from day one as opposed to the normal day four. And also for those who are potentially on a lower income, there is the benefit from the government, the £500 grant that people can uh, tap into if they are in that position that they need a bit more support. So the first step is, like I say, the policy. Look at your policy. If it's a normal sickness issue, then you deal with that as you would normally. So that would involve your return to work, to discuss with your staff members, to say, well, look, what was the issue? Is it something that's ongoing? Is it something that needs a bit more management? Or is it just, I've had a bit of a cold or a sore tummy or whatever it may be. And then you just deal with that on your normal return to work. Something just to highlight here on the basis of 1HR. So obviously part of the 1HR system itself does look at sickness records. So this, the system itself, you log on and you say, for example, not using Dan Minor just only because he's there, Dan's been sick for two days and he's had a sore tummy. So you'd record that on 1HR and then it would show you his level of sickness. So that's the first point of call is to find out what the problem is and record it in your return to work. Like I say, if you've got 1HR, then you'd record it on that. And that gives you the ability to obviously make sure that you're keeping track of somebody's sickness record. So like I say, what's the policy? So you do your return to work call, your return to work form or your return to work Zoom meeting if you're all working remotely and you'd complete your return to work form. If it's something a bit more serious, so if, as I think everybody has, they've had their own sort of struggles with lockdown and the mixture of lockdown, not lockdown, are we being locked down? Um, a lot of people are struggling with that uncertainty. Everybody is, no matter how well you are in your own self-worth, whether you've got a really supportive family, whether you've got, whether you're living on your own, I think everybody's had their own, as I call them, lockdown meltdowns. So that is something that's really important. So when you're dealing with the return to work, even if it's something as simple as a cold, a tummy bug or whatever it is, just pop that extra question on to just say, how are you doing at the moment? It's really tough. We, we, there's been a news announcement saying the schools are only gonna be opening no, no earlier than the end of March, recently today. So ask them how they're doing. Just say, oh, I know you've been off with a tummy bug, but are you all right in everything else? Is there anything we can do to support you? Because at least then, if it turns into something a bit bigger, you've managed it from the early start, as opposed to when somebody could be sort of two or three months down the line, then saying, oh, actually, I've really been struggling for months now, but nobody's ever asked how I am. So as much as you may want to deal with that particular issue, I think it's also a good idea to just add that little bit of extra care to say, are you okay at the moment? Is everything okay? Anything we can do to help? So like I say, if it is a bit more serious, so if somebody's been signed off, particularly with mental health at the moment, people that we've seen loads of cases coming through of people being signed off with anxiety and depression for all these reasons, struggling to cope, struggling to juggle. So people are naturally, their own mental health is probably on a bit of a, um, the their, their level of, of mental health awareness is naturally going to take a bit of a kick, almost like your, uh, your immune system. So their mental health immune system may be struggling. So with those types of cases, what you'd be doing is you'd be doing your welfare call, maybe once a week, once every fortnight, just to check in with that person. Because if they've been signed off for a month, with the best will in the world, that month goes by quickly. If the manager or team leader or head of department hasn't checked in with them, then that person's automatically going to be very disengaged from the business when they think, oh, actually, I've been signed off with anxiety and depression. And my boss hasn't even bothered to give me a call to see how I'm doing. So that would be a welfare health referral, a welfare call. So it's just about checking in with your staff, making notes as you go as well, just to make sure that you've had those conversations, what they've said, because if it needs to in the future, at least you've got a record of what has been said on those calls. If it gets to four weeks plus and that person's still been signed off work, if it's with the same thing, which it's likely to be, you may want to then consider an occupational health referral because if it's a particular issue, particularly if it's mental health, then you as a business need to decide, well, look, how do we get this person back into the business, even if it's working from home, but how do we get them back into the business? Because we need to decide what support we need to give them. If it's the case that they can't work 
for the foreseeable future? Do we need to then look at dismissal route on the basis of ill health capability? So it's those sorts of things that an occupational health referral would look into to determine how you support that person. They may recommend counselling, they may recommend going back to their GP, whatever it is, but at least you as a business can show that you've been supportive, that you know what you need to do as a business to help your staff going forward. And also in terms of if anything goes wrong, you can say, we know that we've managed the case well from the outset. So like I say, accurate record, recording and audit trail. So these things are really, really important. And as much as we don't want to prepare for the worst, at least if you do ever find yourself with a claim against the business or you do end up in an employment tribunal, if you've done all those things, so you've done return to works, welfare calls, occupational health referrals, you can at least show that you've managed to maintain those processes along the way and say, well, we've done all these things. We couldn't possibly have done anything more for them. So at least then you've got your audit trail. And like I say, if you've got one HR and it's been supported through that and it's been logged, you've got that regular audit trail that it shows that that person's been off sick. Just to talk about one HR on that point is one HR part of the, the software does produce um, absence reports. So it's a really useful tool because sometimes you get a bunch of sick notes in and before you know it, six months has passed. With 1HR, what we do is we proactively manage that for you as a business. So we run those reports and we'll say to you, dear Vic, just using Vic because I can see her face. Hi, Vic. Good news. You've had no sicknesses this month. That's really, really good. Or you've still got some sickness, but we've brought it down from where it used to be because it's now being managed more proactively. Or actually, did you know, Vic, Dan's been off for three months now. Oh, I didn't actually because I've just kept the sick notes in the top top of my drawer and they've been left there because we've been in lockdown. So it's those sorts of things that as a business, it's easy to, that time can very, very easily slip away. And before you know it, I've had clients say to me, oh, this person's been on long-term sick for two years now. And you think, how have you coped as a business with somebody on long-term sick for, for such a significant period of time? Um, so it's really important to make sure that you're keeping on top of those things, both for a business just to know where you are and also in the future, just in case anything does go wrong, that you're making sure that you've got your audit trail in place. Next slide, please, Dan. So childcare commitments. So again, it, a lot of this seems quite sort of commonsensical, but where do you start? So again, the, the main focus for a lot of these issues is look at your policy. What is your policy for childcare? A lot of the time it will be emergency dependency leave. So for example, my little boy, Kevin gets a call from school saying Kevin's been sick today, obviously not at the moment because we're in lockdown, but he's been called from school. He's sick. Can you come and collect him? Fine. So phone your lovely boss, Vic, and say, Vic, fortunately, I'm going to have to leave the office. Kevin's been called sick, my other half's still in work. Is it okay if I go and pick him up? Not a problem, of course. So that emergency care under the dependency leave is for an emergency. So it's normally one or two days to make arrangements. Obviously in this situation, in the pandemic that we're in and in lockdown, that is more difficult. So for example, if this had been a normal situation using my example, I'd have gone home, got Kevin sorted, the next day, he'd have probably gone to a mum and stepdad's for them to look after him until he's well enough to go back to school, and I would go back to work as normal. In this situation, it's much more difficult because obviously we're not supposed to see other households, even grandparents. Potentially, there's the argument of informal care, but even then, I think it's a bit of a risk if you're, if you're in that situation. So it's more difficult. So that one or two days dependency care uh, emergency leave could easily creep over into weeks or months. So then it becomes more of a, okay, you've had a day off, it's fine, we'll sort that out, we'll arrange cover. But now this could be extended. So this is a real difficulty for businesses as to how they manage that situation, because then it falls to the set, the bullet point below that, it could fall to employer flexibility as well, because it may be that that then becomes a bit more of a flexible working application to say, well, actually I need to do something a bit more than this, other than just this emergency care. So like I say, staff are entitled to that under the statute, but where this emergency care at the moment draws a line is very difficult to say because a lot of it will depend on the size of the business, will depend on what the business can cope with, um, etc. So it's very, very difficult to say where that emergency care line draws. So like I say, it's about employer flexibility. It's about having those conversations with your staff as well. So if people say, well, actually, I need to 
work slightly different hours because the kids are in school between nine and three. So could I span my work day? I think every working parent has had this, that they probably log on earlier than they would if they were in the office, work a bit later in the evening after the kids have finished school and all those sorts of things. The other thing to note as well is the childcare commitments, staff can be furloughed just for that reason. The first lockdown, the system was slightly different, but they have now changed it that if someone's got childcare commitments, they can be furloughed because of that reason. So you don't have to look at whether there's work available for them, but they can be furloughed on the basis that they have childcare commitments, which they can't um, sort of juggle around work, particularly if they've got quite a high pressure job that needs them to be at a laptop or available during the working day. Next slide, please, Dan. Motivating staff. So this is something that I think we at HPC and 1HR have said a lot of the time is um, it's really difficult to motivate your staff, but sometimes the smallest things can actually be the biggest improvement. We, I think we are really good at it at HPC and 1HR that we regularly speak to each other, even just within the teams, like I'll phone Lauren during the day or I'll phone Jade or we'll text each other or whatever it is. And those little things that you would normally not even think about when you're in the office together, are really, really important. So how do you motivate your staff during this period of time when everything's up in the air, nobody knows when we're going back to whatever the new normal is, etc. So something that we do, and we did very, very much more in the first app, in the first pandemic, the first lockdown, is keep in touch meeting. So we had a regular call every day to say, obviously we were all thrust into it last March, um, keep in touch meeting. So we had a little call every day just to go, how's everybody doing? Anything new to report? Obviously we talk about work issues as well, but it was just a general, let's keep in touch. Let's all have a chat because we've all got our own home pressures. We've all got our own situations going on that we all need to go, oh, actually, this is really stressful. This is really getting me down. And some people don't cope well working from home. So having those keep in touch meetings, even if it's virtual, are really, really useful to keep your staff engaged with the business. Team calls, like I've said, we do it throughout the day. Um, quick call to someone say, oh, what are you doing for lunch? Or I'm cycling or I'm doing this or whatever it is. Or what did you do last night? Went for a walk. That's probably most of what most people can do at the moment. So checking calls with your staff, whether it's between the staff members or from you as managers to your teams to check into them, to see how they're doing, see if everything's okay, see if there's anything you as a business can do. Like I say, the next thing, be alive to the need to be flexible because people, particularly, I, I say working parents, but working parents, people who've got caring commitments, people who've got maybe elderly parents who are now living with them that weren't before. As employers, you need to be mindful of being flexible because people are juggling things that they've never had to do before. I know I never had to do homeschooling before now. So it's very difficult to try and Keep an eye on your emails, keep an eye on the kids, get, make sure they're getting snacked, make sure your emails are responded to. So juggling all those balls, no matter how good you are at time management, can be really, really difficult. So be alive of the need to be flexible, be alive to the fact that people may be almost creating their own mini work days to say, well, I'll log on a bit earlier, then I'll stop a bit to help the kids get set up for school, and then I'll stop a bit to do the break time, all those sorts of things. So just be, be alive to that. Something Vic and I touched on, I think the one before last, I think it was Vic, was the importance of appraisals. So we're coming up to the end of the financial the financial year, the, the tax year. A lot of companies will build in those types of things, things to do with pay rises, reviews, promotions, those sorts of things. It's so important at the moment to continue with that process because if you let it slide and then, for example, we all go back into the norm in the summer and people haven't had their appraisals, then potentially, for about 16, 17, 18 months, they're gonna to start to feel very disheartened and they'll come back to the business and go, I haven't had an appraisal for 16 months, what's going on? I don't know if I'm performing, I don't know if I'm not performing and all those sorts of things. So it's really important, like I say, Vic and I probably spoke about this quite a lot, the, the last one before, it's really important to make sure you continue to appraise your staff and it may not form the same part as it did last time, where you go out for a coffee and you have a chat and discuss things, but make sure you do it. And even if you do that and you'd normally go out for a coffee, have a virtual coffee. So sit there in your dining room or whatever it is with your coffees and have that appraisal still, because it's so important for staff to make sure that they're feeling that they are in that situation, that they're feeling that they're still appraised and part of the business. 
And the little thing, I know every we all people come to, to work for different reasons, but a thank you is honestly, I think it's one of the most understated things that people like is when they've done something really well, a little thank you to just say, thanks for that. I'm really pleased, did a really great job. Or if it's a team issue, well done team, you did really well. We got one over the weekend from Vic's team because Vic's team did amazingly last week. So Friday night, got a team WhatsApp from everybody saying, well done to my team because they've done this really well. Great. And then we all contribute and go really, really great. It keeps the motivation for the staff then because everybody goes, great, these things are being noticed. I've been noticed because I've done something well and all those sorts of things. And then everybody jumps on it because it's something positive to look forward to, to go, let's celebrate the successes because at the moment it is difficult because there's so much doom and gloom. So when you get these little celebrations, do it, say thank you. And that means so much more because obviously people are ready for the weekend in a positive way, then go, great, I feel great. My boss has recognized me. So yeah, it's really, really important. Like I say, thank you. Two of the most important words that you could ever say. Next slide, please, Dan. So this is the Q&A session now. So we've had some questions that I've noticed pop into the, the, the uh, chat group. And we've got some, like I say, that we've had from clients over the last few weeks. So some of those will be pertinent to everybody. Some of them may not be, but they are things that are coming, general themes coming through to us. Brilliant, Dan. Thanks so much for, for that session. And that was really, I, I found it really useful. And I think it, it's important at the beginning, the way you sort of broke it down and that categorization of absence, which is, is very key, particularly now more than ever. It's, it's quite complicated for, for any employer. Um, Dan, I'm going to, Dan Minor, got a lot of Dan's in our business. <laughs> Just recruit Dan's and then we, and Alex's, and then we don't go wrong. <laughs> uh, Dan Miner, can I hand over to you now just to sort of manage the questions, please? And like mentioned before, we have got some questions that have already been asked, uh, but if there's anything else you think of, anything that it prompts, it doesn't have to be related to absence. We're, we're obviously here in a, in a sort of general capacity as well. It's an opportunity within the People Hub to, to sort of bounce ideas off one another and, and give you some advice. So over to you, Dan. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Vic. Uh, I don't know if you want to start by addressing the question that we've had in the chat. Uh, from Jackie. Uh, I think it was just in relation to what Dan was running through there in terms of motivating your employees, just asking how this works during a time where your business is closed and all staff are furloughed. Um, I can, well, should we, we'll split this one, Dan, because I suppose I can look at it from um, sort of an employer's perspective, because in the first lockdown, I had a few of my sales team furloughed. Um, they had childcare, mainly due to childcare issues, to be honest. And I think what was very important was communication. And I think people were very fearful at the time because they were furloughed uh, as an employer of, of like how much you could do, how much you could communicate, but you are fine to communicate. I'm sure you are aware from a lot of our other sessions, you can do training days that, that they would have to be paid, but you can do that. Um, but to even just, just have that engagement we still had you know around team meetings we still invited people that were furloughed i think that is is really crucial as well uh, because it's obviously for, for a business where everybody's furloughed it's slightly different from a business where you've got part of the business operating and part furloughed but at, at some point we are going to get back to a level of normality and you want you don't have to parachute those people back into the business they're probably feeling quite nervous and and um concern now anyway you only have to put on the news to, to feel maybe fear their job so I think just having trying to touch base and, and have some sort of communication is absolutely fine when people are furloughed Dan I don't know if you want to add anything to that yeah I think the only thing is um, in terms of how does it work so like I've said certainly from our business we've got a whatsapp group we've got our own mini ops we've got an ops group and we've got a sales group but then we've got a general hpc one hr group so that's what we do we often keep in touch and it might be sometimes we'll see something silly on a, a gif or whatever it might be and it'll just get everybody going oh yeah that's really silly or did you see this or whatever it is so those little things even stuff like when everybody is furloughed and the businesses are closed just those keeping in touch things like we've something we do as a business is we have a birthday club so we all put money in and then people get a gift voucher or whatever it is and we've still maintained that throughout lockdown even when people have had their business their birthdays and they've been in lockdown whatever it may be we've still said oh here's your gift voucher go and spend it on what you want 
well, obviously when you can. So those little traditions that businesses have their own traditions. So even those during lockdown, you can still maintain them and still keep people active and in, engaged by just doing those little things um, to keep people in touch. And it might just be a WhatsApp message every now and again or an iMessage or whatever it is just to keep in touch and then people will just think oh great we are still part of the business even though it's closed for now because there is light at the end of the tunnel so yes the business may be closed but the plan is obviously to reopen everything and get back to the new normal whenever it is. Perfect. Um, we've had another question in the chat from Julie who's just asked when you mentioned an occupational health referral what exactly do you do you mean? Who do they or who do we refer to? Okay, so an occupational health referral is um, essentially it's a, a referral to an external aid, medical agency who have specialist nurses and doctors and practitioners who deal with purely issues related to work, related getting people back into work. So, for example, somebody's on long term sick. Um, you as a business can't decide when that person's going to come back. So an occupational health specialist will speak to that person, probably not examine them at the moment with everything being sort of virtual, but will certainly speak to them to discuss the issues that they have. And they'll say, for example, what is it that's making you not come into work? Now, if they're signed off with something like anxiety and depression, what they may do is say this person needs, for example, counseling, CBT, or they may say, actually, this person can't come back to work at all. In which case, then that would be a decision for you as a business to say, well, do we need to exit this person on the basis of uh, ill health capability? Through what through HPC, we obviously have contact with external medical agencies that we can start that ball rolling for you. Um, or if you're not, not a client of HPC, then you can certainly contact us and we can certainly give you some contact details to make those referrals if that's what you wanted to do. Okay, excellent. We've had another question in the chat again, this time from Claire, just asking, is the furlough payment at the, at the discretion of the employer if someone refuses to return to work or now has a second job? Okay, so there's two issues there, Claire. So if somebody's been furloughed and um, they refuse to return to work, so is, I assume that's the first situation. They've been furloughed, you've said you need to come back to work, either fully or partly furloughed. If, if I'm wrong, please feel free to drop it further in the, the chat. But if someone's been asked to return to work, then unless they've got a valid reason to do so, so for example, they've got a caring commitment or they are shielding or they can't because they've got childcare. So unless they have a valid reason, then it's arguable that they're absent without leave. You may not want to be as harsh as you would normally in the absent without leave process, but what you would do is say, for example, you were due back to work on Monday, the 25th of January. You've not returned. Is there any reason why? If over the next couple of days or so, they're still not engaging once you've phoned them, WhatsApp them, emailed them, then potentially they are deemed unauthorised. The absence is unauthorised because there's no valid reason once they've been asked to return to work for them to no longer stay off. So if it gets to the point where you're sort of three or four days into it and they've still not communicated, despite you emailing them, texting them, calling them, then potentially they're, they're no longer authorised leave. So you may then want to put them on notice and say, unless you come back, this is no longer authorised leave. So therefore, we're not going to continue to pay you because it's like, take aside COVID, if someone just didn't turn up for their work for three days running, then you wouldn't pay them for it because they're in breach of their contract. So despite the fact that we're in this global situation, people still have to fulfill their contracts. So if they've been asked to come back to the business and they haven't done without a valid reason, then it's deemed unauthorized absence. In the second point, um, if someone's now got a second job, there's two issues with that again. So that would depend on your contract. So do you have do they have to seek permission from you to get a second job? Most contracts will say that's the case. It's called an exclusivity clause. You may, during this situation, say, oh, look, we'll draw aside, uh, uh, draw the line under that because of what's gone on. But if they've got a second job and they've been asked to return to their primary job, i.e. yours, then they, unless they've had that agreement, then they should return to your job. And you are within your rights to say, you weren't authorised to take a second job. You didn't ask us. So therefore, you have to cease that job. Okay, perfect. Um, we've got a yeah, another question in the chat here from uh, Jackie. Um, so she just asks, what about holidays during lockdown? Um, our holidays run from April to March, and as we are closed, 
some furloughed staff have days still to book and want to book them for when we potentially reopen. Can we specify that, that they take them during the, during the furlough so they are available to return when we reopen, uh, obviously paying them for when, for them during their furlough? Okay, yeah, so holidays still continue to accrue during furlough, so those people will still have accrue those holidays as they would if they were working. So there's a couple of issues that you, there's a couple of ways that you can deal with this because businesses are conscious that people are accruing all this leave, we're coming to the end of the holiday leave, so there's a couple of ways that you can do it. The first way is to ask people, is to just say, for example, we'd like everybody to take a week's leave before the end of the holiday year. So that could be take one day a week, I know certainly, um, other businesses that we've advised said we want everybody to take one day a week for the next month. That obviously chips away at the holiday. So you can ask people. The second way is you can force them to take leave. So under regulation 14.4 of the Work and Time Regulations, provided that you give them double the amount of notice of the time you want them to take off, you can force them to take leave. So if you want them to take a week off, you'd give them two weeks notice and say, for example, from week commencing 14th of February, we want you to take a week's holiday. So provided you've give them, given them double the notice, you can force them to take that leave. The other thing is under emergency regulations that were passed last year, any unused holidays that have not been reasonably practicable to be taken can be rolled over in the, into the following two holiday years. Okay, perfect. I think that covers all the questions we have in the chat at the moment. Um, we've got some questions that were submitted prior to the session or common questions that we've been asked from our clients. So I'll just um, ask the two of you uh, some of these questions that we had through. So Vic, I'll ask you this, uh, the first question. So it's, uh, I have a member of my team that is struggling with their childcare and I think they would really benefit from being placed on furlough or flexible furlough. Uh, I will top up their salary so they don't suffer a financial detriment, but is there anything else should, I should be aware of as an employer? This is a really interesting point, actually, Dan, because it, it's come up quite a bit recently and I am involved in a, a HR directors forum. And we, we met yesterday and were discussing this because quite a lot of organisations have offered sort of voluntary, flexible furlough. So they've acknowledged that there's potentially a challenge for people that have got children at home. You know, this it, it depends on the school as well. I, I know this personally myself, I've got two children one child has quite a lot of online support, the other gets packed and I'm expected to homeschool her and do my full-time day job as well. So, you know, lots, lots of businesses are, are, you know, lots of businesses and their employees and their business are, have faced these challenges. So what a lot of organisations are now doing is if they offer the flexible furlough, give them the option to be able to maybe reduce their time and just take some pressure off. There is a concern that we have found that, that lenders, so for mortgages, for example, loans, they, they are looking, some lenders, not all lenders, are looking, not looking favourably at employees that are furloughed, which is, which is terrible. Uh, but one thing that we've discussed this week is that, that potential, I think if it's a voluntary furlough as well, that you do need to declare that to the employee, because if they're making the choice to be furloughed, then they need to be aware that if they do intend to move, you know, it might not be an issue because they may have no intentions, but there are some lenders out there having spoken to some sort of brokers as well that for the next two years, we'll be looking to see if people have been furloughed. So it's just, just worth you noting and bearing in mind when, when you are discussing furlough with people. Excellent, thanks Vic. Um, and another one of the questions that we've had through uh, is that someone's asked that they're, uh, they're quite old school and don't really do appraisals and meetings with their team uh, usually, but what can they do during the lockdown while staff are working at home to kind of maintain this communication or kind of implement some level uh, of contact or appraisal during this time? Yeah, so I think if I think businesses have, have had to move with the times for, for a number of reasons over the last 10 months. So businesses will find, like you say, some people are very old school, they don't do appraisals, they don't do a lot of this kind of keeping in touch things. But I think it's so important that staff and businesses start to move with the times to some extent is because if you don't engage with your staff, particularly during these really, really difficult times when everybody's got their own their own issues to deal with their own family situations, which could be very difficult because nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors because 
it's, it's like that whole period over Christmas. Some families all fall apart because it's the first time that you're all together for such a constrained period of time. So you don't know what your staff members are going through. So even though you may feel old school and you're not used to doing all this, how are you and all those sorts of things, I think it's really important because if you don't know, that might be the one call that saves that person from being on the ledge or however you want to phrase it. So it's really important for you to make sure that you are, and you don't have to do loads. You don't have to be sort of championing from the front, but that little call just to say, I'm just phoning to check how you're doing today, Dan, because that might be the one day where you go, oh, you know what? I'm really, really struggling. The kids are driving me bonkers. I've got a puppy that's barking all over the show. It's just eating the letters or whatever it may be. So that might be the one day where that person really needs that little bit of a different pick me up from the, the norm because at the moment a lot of families are very much isolated because they can't see family they can't see friends everybody is staying at home more so I think it, even though it might be difficult and outside your comfort zone then it doesn't take much to just pick up the phone to your staff and go oh hi Julie just check and see how you are you're all right at the moment and then if something comes from that that you don't know how to tackle then obviously we're here to support you so you may have that issue you go I you don't know what to do just say, okay, I'll look into that for you and I'll come back to you. Make sure you give a time frame as well. Say, oh, I'll come back to you by the end of today on that. Or I'll come back to you tomorrow once I've looked into it to see if I can help on that issue or whatever it is. So it's just about adapting along with every other business really at the moment. Okay. Just to add to that, Dan, because everything that you've said then is absolutely bob on. And one thing I would just add, I think I've mentioned this a few times now is, as business owners or HR professionals, we will be remembered for the way in which we act in, in, in this year. So I think if we do have to go outside of our comfort zone and, and involve slightly our practices, it's very important because our people will remember us for it. So just an extra point. Just in a, in a similar vein to that, um, one of the questions we were asked is that, um, some businesses or this person after they normally do like their yearly reviews or appraisals with their staff at this time of year, is it still worth going ahead with those meetings and having those conversations? Whilst even though we're all working from home and currently in a lockdown. Well, I think Dan's, Dan's obviously picked up on this in the presentation. I, I can speak sort of freely from our business as well. So I think it's important to draw upon some some sort of um, examples and we absolutely are we normally would hold our away day in January which which I'm not sure the virtual one's going to work that well um, but but anyway we normally hold that and we talk about sort of the overall business objectives for the year and then we would have our individual PR and D's with, with each member of the team that's still going to happen we're going to do something virtually to kick it all off and then we are going to do those PR and D's and you know we had hope that we may have sort of come out of a lockdown um but that's not going to happen so those those dates are still going in the diary uh and you know to dan's point before you can still have a virtual coffee you know may, maybe schedule a little bit more time for your sort of appraisals this time and your reviews it might take a little bit longer given internet challenges that we all seem to have i know i certainly have quite a few of them uh but they they, sh they do need to happen and they need to be logged you know for those of you that are on this call i see that are white jar clients log them on there, make them sure they're live documents because you want to have productive team members this year. Uh, some of you may be closed right now. You're not going to be closed all year. You want to make sure that, that your people are engaged and productive. And the only way in which to do that is to ensure that they're clear on what their objectives are. Perfect. Um, Dan, if, if I could ask um, you... Could I ask just a follow-up question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, um... It was a follow-up question to um, uh, what you were saying before, Dan, Daniel, about uh, furlough and holiday. Is, is now an okay time? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fire away. Yeah. Um, so you said that there was some kind of emergency legislation that means that people can carry holiday over um, into the next two years. Yes. Um, is there any kind of like um, limits on that or anything? Because I guess as small businesses that could be quite challenging to um, like manage so much additional holiday um, to be spent. Um, like can the business um, set any kind of limitations on that? Like say carry over two, just two weeks of holiday or? 
sure. So the, the legislation that was passed that says that up to four weeks can be rolled over. So that's so holidays are broken down. Um, everybody's entitlement is 5.6 working weeks. So it's split into statutory, which is the first four weeks, and then the 1.6 is additional just because of the way that the UK has theirs, because it's based on the, the, the working time directives, the four weeks working, the four working weeks. So up to four weeks can be rolled over. But like I say, there are other ways to chip away at that, because like you say, if you've had people on furlough, for example, since last March and they've not come back to the business, then to, to potentially have all that leave rolled over is going to be quite a big chunk to the business. Because what you've got to think of is, for example, if people leave, then you're going to have all that accrued holiday that if they reach the end of their notice period and they've got, for example, four, five, six weeks accrued, that's going to be another month, a month and a half salary that you may potentially have to pay them if and when they, they leave the business. So like I say, up to four weeks can be carried over, but there's those other two ways to get people to use their holiday. Because the other thing is if staff have been furloughed at 80%, then they may want that little extra top up. So if you say, well, look, would you mind taking a week's leave? Obviously, you'll be topped up to 100% of your normal salary because you have to pay holiday at 100%. Then people may go, oh, actually, yeah, that bit of extra cash boost might may be really useful following on from christmas people may have overspent not sure what on because everywhere was closed but nevertheless um so that might be a really useful way to do it if you do it again in an engaging way and say actually we're just thinking about holidays holiday years coming up um would you like to take some of the, your holidays now because obviously you'll be paid your full daily rate if you've been on 80 percent at the moment so staff might actually benefit from that and then they almost feel like it's their decision as opposed to the business going right we're giving you the notice you're taking this holiday on whatever day it is um and it may be that people may say well actually i'll take one day's holiday a week so then i've got a four day working week for the next month and actually that's quite a benefit to some other people who say well great i've got one day that i can focus on the kids or the housework or i've got one day extra to myself to, to just Go for a walk in the park or whatever it might be so that's the way that, that i would probably address it and do it on a positive way as well because then people feel like they've already bought into it to some extent mm -hmm. and, and is it um is it kind of lawful to um sort of agree between the business and the employees to um because because we've had people on and off furlough the whole year and but we've been paying at 100 percent the whole time anyone's on furlough so would it be lawful for us to kind of sit down and maybe sort of allocate some of the weeks that people were off and sort of say that they were holiday as, as long as we had a, a kind of record of what was just furlough and what was furlough and holiday? I think my view is to backdate anything in it and then as a qualified lawyer I, I see the, the horror stories of this all the time. So my view is to never backdate anything because you don't know because obviously HMRC can audit anybody's furlough claim at any point in time. So the last thing you need is an HMRC audit where there is this potential backdated agreement to say, well, actually, that period was holidays and we'll say that period was holidays. So I would never advise anybody to backdate anything. If, if you choose to do that, like I say, the caveat on that is HMRC can audit at any point in time. And I know certainly I've seen articles on LinkedIn about that to say that you shouldn't, that be alive to the fact that they may audit. So that will be my advice is don't backdate anything because there's always a risk that it could get found out. And the last thing you need is HMRC saying, well, actually you've put something backdated that wasn't agreed. And do you really wanna put your staff in that position as well to say, well, look, let's just agree that that was backdated because the, the point is, and I know it's difficult with furlough, is that holidays are for rest and relaxation to use as you choose um, and not to use as to, to kind of cover this hybrid um, furlough holiday situation. So it is difficult, but that would be my advice um, is to not backstate anything. Anything you wish to add on that, Vic, at all? I think just your point, Dan, that you made earlier about the notice as well. So, you know, if it's not sort of voluntary, then you do need to provide that notice. So for however many days that you want to allocate to that employee for leave, you have to give them double that notice. So, I, you know, totally, totally agree with you on that, Dan. I'd, I'd just give the notice and, and, and get and book in the leave now rather than backdate anything. But I, I do think as well, Dan, you know, and, and hopefully, the, you know, the same for you, Grace, that a lot of employees are, you know, particularly what you're doing, Grace, and, you know, you're giving people 100%. 
um, they understand the, ch the challenges that business owners are going through as well. And, and, you know, I've found with our business that everybody's worked together on it. So I think having those open and honest conversations goes a long way. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I didn't fully understand what would be the, the kind of problem from HMRs audited you and found because because aren't you allowed to be on holiday whilst you're on furlough so yeah, what, absolutely what, you are entitled to take be, with that yeah you are entitled to be on holiday um while you're on furlough absolutely no issue at all my only concern would be is if you're saying for example actually we'll allocate those two weeks back in July as holiday then we don't know how detailed HMRC audits are going to be. So they could say, fine, can you show us the holiday request form that you put through? Can you show when you approve that holiday? We don't know. So this is the difficulty is even for us as advisors, we don't know how detailed those audits are going to be. So if they may not do anything, we don't know. But they could be really, really detailed because as you can imagine that the billions and billions of pounds that this furlough scheme, self-employed schemes have cost uh, the government and us as taxpayers ultimately, we don't know how, how detailed those claims are going to be. So all I can say is that's my advice. If you choose, to, like we always say in any situation, if you choose to go against that, to some extent, that's your choice to make. But like I say, they may be really, really detailed and say, show me the holiday request, show me when it was approved, show me when it was requested. What does your holiday policy say? We don't know. So all I can say is there's always that caveat that they can, they can audit at, at any point in time. And we don't know when that's going to be. I know certainly I've seen LinkedIn posts where people say, oh, actually, I've been contacted by HMRC about my furlough claims. I know one of my friends, she owns her own restaurant. She's been asked by HMRC to prove her eat out to help out schemes. Of, and so HMRC are certainly starting to look into all the money that's been spent from these grants and, and, and um, furlough schemes and stuff like that. So that's all I'd say is that that's my opinion um, as, as a, a lawyer and an advisor. But like some clients, I, all I can say is that's that's my view and my opinion if, if you don't want to follow the guidance then that, that's people's own choice just conscious of time now dan i know you're going to do sort of a bit of a round up on what what's in the employment law pipeline do you think it's probably a good good time to do that and then we can just any final questions and then wrap up yeah of course absolutely so um i think we've, we've focused on a lot of the challenges from businesses today so and, and a lot of the the issues that we've covered are start with the policy so there's been quite a, a an interesting case coming out recently um of failure to follow your own policy so to some extent as businesses particularly the businesses that we help part of it is we draft your contracts your handbooks your policies and procedures so there's no point going to that expense or even if it's through an erdf funded pot to go to that trouble to have the policies but then not follow them it's just it's a waste of your time and everybody else's so the point of having those policies in place is so you as employers and business managers and hr managers know what to do and the staff also know what is requested and needed of them in those situations so this particular situation was for jaguar land rover so there was someone who'd had i think it was eight, 80 shifts worth of sickness um it may it may have been 800 actually it was quite, a, either way, it was quite a lot. And basically they'd, long story short, they'd said that this person was clearly unwell for work, had numerous shifts missed. They'd, to some extent, followed their own procedure. Um, they tried to refer him to occupational health. They hadn't done it as well as they should have done. So long story short, they ended up dismissing him under a disciplinary policy for on the basis that it was an un sustained level of absence which businesses can do there's no problem with doing that provided that you follow a your own policy and b a fair policy because this person had been there for several years so obviously had the right to unfair dismissal so he was dismissed on the basis of an, a, a substantial level of sickness which like i say the business can do <clears throat> he brought a claim for unfair dismissal and the tribunal found that he had been unfairly dismissed because the business hadn't followed their own process because there was a time period where the process was changing. So at one point it was, this was the process to follow. And then because of the change in policy, it was a different policy, but they'd followed the wrong one. And so because of that, the tribunal said, well, look, you've got this policy in place, massive company, in-house HR, probably outsourced HR and legal support as well. 
you should have got it right. You didn't. You've dismissed this guy on the basis of a disciplinary, whereas it could have quite easily gone down the ill health capability route. They'd already involved occupational health. So on that point, they should have just stuck with that. And that would have been the safest route to take. But unfortunately, they did it gung ho and said, right, let's discipline this person for um, horrendous levels of sickness. And so they, the, the tribunal found in the claimant's favour. And that's going to cost them probably six figures easily, without a doubt, on the basis that he's been there for a long period of time. And, um, and all the heads of claim, obviously, he's got the future losses. So that's just a really good example of don't have these policies in place, but then not follow them. And that's why we're here to guide you, obviously, if you're one of our clients. We guide you throughout the whole process so it's as easy and smooth as possible. So we say, this is what you need to do. This is the next step that you need to take. So then that you know that you've got the full protection. So should this situation happen, you can say, well, we managed it really well. We did, like I said at the start, welfare calls, return to work, occupational health referrals, those sorts of things. So that's a really important um, case to follow is follow your own policies. In terms of other things around the corner, there's, there's not a huge amount of anticipated statutory changes in terms of any new legislation. Obviously, April comes around every year. The statutory rates for things like sickness, statutory sick pay, statutory maternity pay, paternal leave, um, adoption leave, etc. That is likely to change as usual. It usually goes up by a few percent here or there. So that is likely to come in as well. Obviously, we've got good old Brexit as well, chomping at the bit. Um, so we did do a bit of a presentation on that, and we've done some um, communications to clients about things they need to be concerned about in terms of the point system coming through for recruiting externally from Europe or outside. So that's just something to be mindful of in the future, that if you are going to recruit from the EU, that you will need to, potentially you'll need to have a sponsorship license, and you'll also need to make sure that you're attracting people from both within the country and without um, outside the EU to say, well, are these the right people and are they there for a particular reason? Do they meet the point system? So um, so that's where we are at the moment, a bit of a, a roundabout update of things to come. But I'm sure come April there'll be more, which there always is. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so again, I don't want to take too much of your time today. These sessions are supposed to be sort of short and, and sharp and, and really helpful. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you do, obviously the People Hub, we're, bringing, we're building a really strong community now. So anybody, any business owners, HR professionals, really like the idea of being able to share best practice advice and, and just to hear you know your ideas as well. I know I've said it quite a few times, but we are in unprecedented times. So things like a people hub community are really important so if you do know anybody that you think will benefit from this please bring them along to the next session or drop one of us an email and, and we'll invite them to the next session we also have um the linkedin group as closed group as well so please if you're not a member of that already uh, jump on onto that and we just again share some some great ideas on there if there's any ideas anything that you'd like for the next webinar let us know but uh, it's so lovely to see uh, so many familiar faces today nice to see you virtually so have a great week anyway and we'll see you all again soon bye now <laughs>